celebrate anything. I hope you're having a good day. You know, you can still be thankful that 2020 is almost over. So that's that's kind of something to celebrate. We're just got a few more days of this crappy year, and then hopefully 2021 is going to be a lot better. So uh, I wanted to make this video to go over some of the, the principles, some of the strategies, things I used over the years to transform myself from a guy with average genetics. I started out very young. Um, I'm going to go up front and say, a lot of you immediately, the answer is when I, you see the question, how I gained over 100 pounds of muscle, you're going to say drugs, drugs. And I'm not going to shy away from that, guys. I'm going to be real. I'm going to be transparent. The last 25 pounds, I estimate, pretty much almost exactly 25 pounds of that 100 pounds plus was due to steroids added on to the natural gains I had made for many years. So I, I realized recently that I've been saying forever that I started training at age 14 at 95 pounds, but that's, that's not accurate. That's when I started uh, going to my friend Paul Poirier's house after school to his uh, attic and he had a bunch of weights and that, that's when I started training with somebody. But for almost a full year before that, uh, I, when I, the, the Christmas after I turned 13, I, I had asked for a weight set, a bench and weights, and I got one. I think it was Marcy was the company. So I was doing some training already at home for sure. Now I didn't know how to do too many exercises. All I really did was bench press curls. I would clean the bar and do shoulder presses, but I, I certainly wasn't doing the whole body routine. I didn't even train legs until I was 18. So I started lifting weights at 13, didn't do anything for legs till I was 18. And of course, they blew right the hell up. Um, I'm going to get to all your questions at the end. I realize that's probably the best way to do it so I don't lose my train of thought. Um, so I'm going to do that. But right now, I want to get into it. Now, when I talk about that, oh, I'm going to turn the volume off on that. So when I started training, I probably was about 90 pounds, maybe even a little lighter, lighter than that. Of course, I was only 13 years old. Um, ultimately, uh, I got to my high was 245, but that was sloppy. So we go by stage weight. So if I was, uh, the last contest I competed at before I tried drugs, before I started drugs, not like I tried them and said, oh, I didn't like those. I, I kept using them. Was in 1995 in July, I did the NPC Ironman naturally in Redondo Beach, California. I was 181 pounds. So that was my stage weight. I was in really good shape for that show. Very lean. It was the best condition I'd ever been to up, up to that point in my life. On drugs, I did surpass that condition. So my weight was 181. Now, the heaviest I ever competed on drugs in really good condition was about 205. I'd been 205, I'd been 208, but it wasn't quite as good. 205 or so, that was my best best look. Very, very lean, shredded. Um, so 181 to, what did I just say? 205, that's about 25 pounds, 24 pounds. That was the difference between um, training naturally all those years and competing and then going on drugs. So it was about 24, 24 pounds. So if you figure I started out at probably about 90 pounds, uh, and let's say my lean weight was, I don't know, 85 pounds, because I wasn't shredded to the bone at 90 pounds. <laughs> I was a kid, I was 13. So uh, my sh best shredded weight was 205, and I'm 5'8", if that matters to any of you guys. But before I get into the drug stuff, because uh, I will get into it, but I spent most of the, that time, built, I built most of that muscle drug free. And I don't have awesome genetics by any means. I don't have elite genetics. I'm sure they're a little, they're better than the average person's. Um, certain body parts of mine certainly responded much better than even a lot of pros I know. Like my chest always grew. A lot of pros have had trouble building chests that I've, I've known. Quads always grew on me once I started training them. Arms never really responded the same way. Shoulders blew up. My shoulders used to be much bigger actually than this before my joint problems and the arthritis and all that. But um, just to give you background, how I started, I believe most of it was mental because I was nuts about getting bigger and stronger. Crazy. So before I even had weights, I can remember being probably 10 or 11 years old, probably about 11. And I'd be in my room and every, every night before I went to bed, I would do uh, 100 push-ups and 300 sit-ups. It's, it's, I don't know where, where I got those numbers or why I, it seemed like that was a smart thing to do. I would do 100 100 push-ups, 300 sit-ups, and then I would go downstairs, and I knew nothing about nutrition, but I knew milk, milk was supposed to be good, milk made you grow, right, that's what babies drink, so I would go drink a big, big glass of milk, like, I don't know, probably like 16 ounces, maybe 20 ounces, and my mother used to get so mad, because, you know, we, we had a bunch of kids, there were seven of us, we didn't all live in the, at home by then, but she'd say, stop drinking all the milk, she was pretty upset, 
so that was before weights, but I had already been inspired by, um, I saw the movie Pumping Iron when I was, I think, eight years old. It was on PBS late at night, and I saw that, and I was like, oh, my God, what are these people? They're like aliens from another planet. I want to look like that. Um, probably even bigger influence for me, I've talked about this before, was pro wrestling. And I grew up in the 70s, uh, in the 80s, and I started watching pro wrestling back when it was still kind of an underground thing. You know, it was like low class, not that it's like high society fair now, but back then it was only on Saturday mornings on UHF stations. If you know what that means, if you don't, Google UHF stations, you youngsters, and you'll, you'll realize what that means. Those weren't the big networks. Those were like the smaller affiliate, uh, smaller independent stations. So that's where I watched uh, WWF uh, originally, uh, and even Texas wrestling, and I, uh, that that's what uh, was a bigger inspiration to me than the bodybuilders. Cause I used to see these physiques of like, uh, Polish power, Ivan Putski, Jimmy, Superfly Snuka, superstar, Billy Graham, um, Hulk Hogan, back when he was just a bad guy. This is before he went over to WWF and became like a mega star. Uh, Kerry Von Erich from the Texas wrestling uh, channel, other show. I wanted to look like those guys, those guys to me, they were, they were studs. I, I had to be like that. And um, I got the weight set when I was 13. And, um, you know, it came with a little manual. I followed along with that. Uh, I started going to the boys club downtown because they had, in my town, Waltham, Massachusetts, because they had more weights. Uh, it was always precarious because a lot of the kids from the wrong side of the tracks hung out there. And I remember one time getting, trying to do a bench press. Some kid came up. I didn't even know the kid. He punched me in the nuts. Yeah, it was a, it was a rough crowd down there. So, uh, but like I said, when I was 14, I started training with my friend Paul. And I was very consistent after that. I'd say at 13, I was, wasn't that consistent. I remember I hated the pain of it. The pain of the, the ache and the burn, the lactic acid burn. Uh, I used to have this weird fantasy that like somebody could hypnotize me. Uh, I don't know if I thought it'd be at night or at some point every day and train me. And I wouldn't know about it and I wouldn't feel the pain, but I would just grow. I just wanted the results without the pain. Uh, you know, later I would come to embrace the pain and, and develop a much higher threshold for pain. But back then I was still kind of a wuss about it. I didn't get very good results at 13, 14, because uh, I was just starting to hit puberty at 14, really. I was kind of a late bloomer. Shocking, I know. And um, once, I'd say by the time I was 16, I started seeing some results. For a long time, I was just lifting and lifting and lifting, and I looked exactly the same. Nothing really. You know, I was gaining a pound or two every few months. Nothing spectacular at all. Not until I had the, pro the proper hormonal environment. You know, once I was able to start shaving at 16, I think I finally shaved for the first time and that's around the time I started putting on a little bit more weight so I trained all through high school ninth which for me was ninth 10th 11th and 12th grades wrestled senior year high school 12th grade um like I said I didn't really I didn't really know about back training I did a lot of chin-ups I like chin-ups and I was good at chin-ups because I was so light I used to knock out sets of 20 chin-ups with no problem of course I wasn't I didn't really know about squeezing the muscle and all that back then that took me a long, long time to, to learn about all that stuff. I didn't really know about nutrition probably till I was 19 or 20. I really started getting a grasp on it. By 21, I was eating like a bodybuilder, quote unquote, with the multiple meals. Um, like I said, so I wasn't training back, uh, but I was nuts about bodybuilding. I, I'd say the tipping point for me when I knew I wanted to look like and be a bodybuilder was, uh, you know, I was messing around with weights, as I said. Uh, I went off to college, my first year of college, I was from Waltham, Mass., but I applied to a few UCs, University of California. So I got accepted at three of them, and I picked University of California, Santa Barbara. When I got there, I had bought a, a jug of wheat or protein or something at the at the local, I don't even know if it was a GNC or just like an independent supplement store in Waltham. But I there was a little card on it where you could mail, if you mailed it in, they would give you a free issue of Flex Magazine, and I mailed it off and forgot about it. And then, you know, my mother... Uh, back home in Massachusetts, she was forwarding all my mail to me in California. So she forwarded that to me. And I think a day or two after I arrived and unpacked and got into my um, off-campus apartment with two other young kids, that magazine came and um, there was a female bodybuilder on the cover. I can't remember who it was. You wouldn't know the name anyway. Someone from the 80s. This was probably like their September, October 1987 edition. But inside they had uh, a big pictorial on Sean Ray, who had just won, I think, the, the junior nationals. He hadn't even won the nationals yet. He would win the nationals uh, a couple months later after I moved to California. But they had a big pictorial on him. He was already a big star. I think he already had a weeder contract and he wasn't even a pro yet. 
And they had coverage of that year's IFPB World Championships, I believe. And man, these the physiques in there, they were nuts. Plus, there was guys in there like, uh, of course, Mr. Haney. Lee Haney was Mr. Olympia at the time. Lee Labrada, Mike Christian, Gary Stridham, Rich Gaspari, Mike Quinn. It was a great group of guys in the, in the late 80s. And, you know, I was, I cut out, I cut the pictures out for the, from the flex and I taped them to my wall for inspiration. And my roommate thought I was, you know, a little strange. And um, the weird thing is I went to the bookstore and it was off campus. And um, I was like, I wanted to buy, a, what could I find about bodybuilding? I'm going to find a bodybuilding book so I can learn about all this stuff and figure out how to get big and strong and all that. And the first book uh, in that, it, it wasn't much selection because it was all, you know, used textbooks for the students and everything. This was all, this is all students. But they had a book called The Nautilus Bodybuilding Book by Arthur Jones. And next to that was The Nautilus Advanced Bodybuilding Book by Dr. Ellington Darden, who was his protege. So Nautilus machines were the first really big name machines. They had the cam wheel and the chain. And Arthur Jones was very, very convincing in the way he wrote trying to explain how his machines were so superior to barbells. You know, they made training with barbells and dumbbells like something a caveman would do. This was so much more advanced and effective. And I bought it hook, line, and sinker. So much so that I had to find a, Nautilus, a gym with Nautilus equipment only. So on campus, they had a free weight room that was just a big, it was like a, a big converted trailer. But it, it was free weights and it was free. If you, know, you just had to show your student ID to get in. But I only went there a couple times. I joined a Nautilus. It was called the Nautilus Room uh, at UCSB uh, as part of the big rec center. Had to pay for it, but you know I didn't mind because in my mind, this Nautilus, these Nautilus machines, they were the shit, man. And free weights were for idiots. You know, <laughs> little did I know. You know, I just turned eighteen years old. I I turned eighteen in in Santa Barbara. Um, so I, I trained that way. I, I read both books. And I decided, well, I'm going to, I need to, I want to get big and strong fast. So I'm going to go get the, uh, the I'm going to read the advanced book and I'm going to follow the workouts because they have like specialization routines for every body part, you know, back this. So I said, well, all my body parts need to be better. So I'm just going to do all the routines. And I did. And, you know, in addition to, they didn't have a leg press at this machine. I should note that all they had for legs in the Nautilus room, Nautilus did make leg couple different types of leg press machines, but this place didn't have them. They had all the Nautilus machines, but for legs, all they had was the extension and the, and the seated leg curl. That's it. Um, so I didn't really start training legs properly for quite a while. I'll get to that. I'm going to try not to make this like 10 hours long, guys. I promise. So I started making gains. I graduated high school around 135. Uh, by the time I left Santa Barbara in the spring, I was probably about 145, and that was, you know, tremendous gains for me. 10 pounds of muscle. I was like, woohoo! Uh, can't wait to get to 150. That's my next big goal. Um, I knew about steroids, but I, I wasn't interested in them. Uh, I thought they were dangerous, you know, the whole Ben Johnson scandal. Um, so I come back to Massachusetts because I transferred. I realized that was a party school, great for parties. They had this, uh, this huge boulevard along the beach called Del Playa Drive that it was all... It was all houses rented by uh, the students, beach houses, like right on the beach over these cliffs. Awesome parties every Friday and Saturday night. But nobody was getting out of that school in four years. I noticed everyone was hanging around for five or six years. I'm like, I don't have that kind of time on my hands. And, you know, my dad had passed away. So all the only money we had for college was whatever my dad had left that my mom hadn't spent. And anyway, had to get out of there. So I went back to Boston, went to Emerson College, where I found a nearby YMCA that had a Nautilus room too, because I still thought Nautilus was the only, the only thing that mattered. Uh, and by this point, I'm starting to, I'm just starting to read up on the magazines. I was buying the magazines every month. I'm starting to realize now that the eating is a lot more important than I thought it was. You know, I hadn't really, I just didn't know I was ignorant. I didn't know you need to feed your body all these calories and protein and carbs and, and fats to grow. I, I didn't know. I would just eat probably like three meals a day, like everyone else. So I found this Nautilus room there. Um, I trained there for most of that school year, um, and I even trained for my first contest on all Nautilus machines. So my first contest was in March of 1989, and I was training at the Nautilus place for it at, at, the, at that YMCA next to Northeastern University in Boston. And uh, I get to the show, uh, didn't do well, didn't do well at all. I was probably about 150 on stage, not that lean. Um, and uh, I went to the, I 
think I was still training. I, I went to the judges after. I knew where one of the judges was. He owned a gym up in Woburn. This guy, Paul Kazupi. So I went in and I got some feedback. And um, he was kind of sarcastic to me because I think he was... Uh, I'm sure I came off as like a know-it-all because I, I thought I thought Nautilus was so great. And I, I'm sure I probably let him know that. So he said, why don't you try training with some free weights? Uh, you, you'll probably do a lot better. You'll probably put on some size. You know, you need you need more size, kid. I was fine. And this was a natural. I should say I competed naturally for the first few years. This was a, an organization called ANBC, American Natural Bodybuilding Conference, based out of Woonsocket, Rhode Island. They're long gone. Uh, that's where Tito Raymond and Jose Raymond also started out in that uh, organization, ANBC. They did a lot of shows in the New England area. And it was drug-free for life. You had to take a polygraph. Don't even, I know all you guys are like, ah, polygraph's bullshit. Um, but anyway, so what was I doing in terms of training? After that, I did join a, I found a world gym in Newton, Mass. That was sort of in between where I lived and where I went to school. So that worked out pretty well. And I started incorporating free weights and machines together. And all of a sudden, I started getting so much better results. Plus now... Uh, I had access. I could squat. I started doing squats, which I built my legs on squats, guys. No two ways about it. I did a lot of leg presses and hacks, but good God, I did a lot of squats over the years. It's, it's funny when people give me shit now because I don't squat. And when I do, it's not heavy. But, you know, in most cases, if it's a young guy, I could tell him, Dude, kid, I was squatting like 500 pounds before you were born. And it's true. I was. So um, I was always like, I always trained very, very hard, though. Uh I was like psychotic. Like I told you, I, I just, I was never satisfied. I always want to get bigger. I always want to get stronger. Strength was important to me, although I was never a power lifter. I, I always sucked at the barbell bench press. It, I sucked ass. I was, I could get, I got pretty strong at dumbbells. You know, eventually I could do one uh, fifties on the flat and on the incline for chest with dumbbells for a good eight to 10 reps, but I was never any good at the barbell. Uh, I was good at overhead pressing for some reason. I could do, in, in front of me, I could do 315 with a barbell in my, by the time I was in my early 20s, uh, I could do, by the time I was in my mid-20s, I could do 140s on the seated dumbbell press, but like I said, I, I, I was horrible at uh, at barbell bench. I could do inclines. Inclines, that nah, wasn't great. 315, that's okay. It's nothing, nothing to write home about, but I, I trained with a lot of lower reps. I did a lot of 8 to 10 rep sets, but I also like to test my strength. And it wasn't so much to test my strength as I was trying to get eight, 10 reps, but I wasn't really strong enough. So a lot of my sets ended up being three, four, five reps. I did a lot of sets like that. And I probably did a lot of damage to my, to my uh, joints because I didn't warm up much at all. I had this idea in my head that if I spent a lot of time warming up, I would expend too much energy and it would take away, it would sap my strength for the heavy sets. So I would warm up. I think I would just do like one warm up set. Like if I was squatting, if I was doing legs and I always did squats first back then. I would put 225 on the bar. That was my first set, my only warm up. Do 225 for 10 reps because I didn't want to waste any energy. And you know, I wasn't on a bike or anything for it. That was my whole warm up. And then 315, 365, 405. Um, and I squatted deep, guys. Um, I do have very naturally flexible ankles, kind of wide hips, short legs. So I was probably ideally built for squats. Uh, I never did 1,000 pound squat or anything like that. I tell people my best squat was 725. That was with somebody hugging me around. I don't know how much of that weight I really did. Who knows? Probably 500 pounds. The other guy was probably doing 225. But, uh, you know, I, I trained to failure. I took all my sets to failure. I did a lot of drop sets. I made the people spotting me give me a lot of force reps. You know, I was, I was really training as hard as I could. And I did that for many, many years. Um, so naturally, by the time I was in my uh, mid to late 20s, my off-season body weight was a, and I was still drug-free for life at this point. I got up to like 225, 230 in the off-season. It was not a pretty 225, 230. It was a very different 225 to 230 than in later years when I was on gear. Very, very different Com body composition. Much more fat, much more water. But, you know, and I would diet down. And like I said, I would diet down. In those, in those years, I was competing naturally. My body weight went from... My first natural show in 89, March of 89, I was one, probably about 150. They didn't weigh us in. I was a junior. Uh, and my last show before I ever started drugs. Now, I did, nat I did tested shows later on in my life, but tested meaning you just had to be off drugs for a year. I was already competing with some muscle that I built on drugs, so I'm not counting that. So the last, 89, I was 150. 95 was the last show I did before I tried, I started drugs in early 97, and I was 181. So... 
uh, I gained about 31 pounds of stage weight in that time. I already gained a bunch of muscle in those years training. So now you want to know about the drugs. Like I said, I, I had been around, I had, I worked around the pro bodybuilding industry for several years at that point. From 91 to 98, I was out in LA uh, working for a company called American Sports Network. And that company did a show, produced a monthly show for, uh, I think it was like 12 years, called American Muscle Magazine. Uh, I think later the title was changed to American Muscle. It was a, it was a one hour show when I started working on it couple of years, three or three years later, so the ESPN, the network, this was on ESPN 1, guys, not ESPN 2 or 3 or the Ocho. They cut it down to 30 minutes. We also did live event productions. Uh, Lou, my boss, Lou Zwick, he put on his own shows called Muscle Mania and Fitness America Pageant, which are still around today. And we also were contracted by uh, various people to do productions. So we did like uh, the Olympia. Like one of the first things I did in 91, my first year with that company, one of the first big productions I did for them was um, I went down to Orlando for that Olympia and I was part of the part of the production team. I was basically just a production assistant. Didn't do a whole lot. I helped out with the interviews and stuff, I remember. But um, yeah, where was I going with that? So I was around the, the, the pros and everything and I started to get an idea of, okay, well, these guys, they are different. They do have different genetics and the but I could also see the drugs made a big difference because I could I saw some of them when they were off drugs and then I saw them when they were on drugs. It was a very dramatic difference, just the way the muscles looked and they would, some of them would lose a lot of size. So, you know, I was a hardcore, holier than now natural bodybuilder for a long time. I wrote, I wrote for some natural magazines. I wrote for Iron Man magazine and I was always really, uh, I was kind of preachy I think at times about steroids. I was, I was so against them and you know, I never, I never thought I was going to use them. I never planned on using them. But after years and years, um, I started thinking, maybe I'll just do them once. And one of the tipping points was in 95, uh, that last natural show I did, the guy that beat me was a guy named Carl List. Trainer, he was a trainer in Gold's Venice. His older brother, Arnie, or was he older? He had a brother, Arnie List, that was a, a high-level national competitor for many years. They were or for a few years. Anyway, they're from Vermont. Carl had been on drugs before. I'm sure he had been off for at least a year at this point, but he still had, uh, no, he had, he had way better genetics than me, but he had, he had size and size that I didn't have. He beat me on size. I was second place. And I started to, you know, suspect, well, maybe if I just did drugs once, I could hold on to enough muscle and I could go back to doing natural shows that were, you know, tested that you only had to be natural for a year or something. And I'd have more muscle on me. So I got Sustanon. They were already loaded. You bought, you got them in Mexico. They were organon sustenon. They came in ready jacks, 250 milligrams in, um, in a little glass amp with the, uh, the needle separately. So you just assembled it, you screwed them together. And they had this, like the needle on it was this 18 gauge, I call it a harpoon. And, uh, it was, you know, the smaller the number, the, the bigger, the hole of the needle. So like a 25 gauge, 30 gauge, that's like what you, 30 gauge is like what a diabetic would use an insulin needle. 25 is probably the smallest needle, 25 gauge that you can put steroids in. I know some of you guys use insulin needles. But anyway, it didn't even occur to me. I had no idea that you could uh, swap it out for a smaller, uh, a thinner needle. Because these things would leave these gaping craters, oozing blood. And sometimes the gear would come out too. But anyway, so that and I got a veterinary uh, nandrolone, Deca, Deca, called um, Norandrin from Mexico. It was a big jug. It was a 50 milliliter jug. And I think it was only 50 milligrams per mil because it was meant for animals. And you can give animals a ton of oil. They're not going to complain. So I had to push a lot of oil in just to get. So I think I was doing one sustenance on a week. My first cycle was one sustenance on a week and enough of the DECA to give me, I think it was 250 or 300. I think I tried to make them the same. I made pretty good gains on that first cycle. I can't say how much I gained because I was I was watery and puffy. So if I gained 20 pounds, it might have been 10 pounds of muscle, which, you know, you're always going to probably make your best gains on the, the first couple cycles you ever do because after that, your body sort of gets used to the drugs a little bit more. It gets accustomed. You, you build up a tolerance over the years. So anyway, did them. I kept doing them throughout, off and on. I would take, I would do like eight weeks on, eight weeks off. And I did that all through 97 I competed in my first show uh, on gear on July 4th, 1997 on Muscle Beach. 
took second in the super heavyweights, which at that show, it's not the same weight. It was like anything over 185 was a super, and I was two, like 204, and I got beat by my chiropractor. Rich, Rich Sage. I know you're out there, Rich. His son, Stephen, follows me on Instagram today. What's up, Steve, if you're watching? So that was, that was the beginning of gear for me, 97. And um, I didn't compete again until uh, I was back in Boston. I did the 2002 New England. It was 212 the night before weigh-ins. I uh, took a couple of diazides, weighed in at 202. Uh, if you ever see on my Instagram, Ron Harris Muscle, I do post a lot of pictures where I had the blonde highlights because that was that show the 2002 New England, and it was one of my best looks. Um, you know, my body was, I don't know the exact cycle, if, if anyone's going to ask me that, but it was basics. It was like tests up until the last, I did tests, a 16-week cycle, I think. And uh, at the end, I swapped out test for Tren. I was using Winstrol tabs, uh, probably Deca. Uh, didn't, didn't, I think I used Clen for that. If, if I don't remember, guys, it's not like I'm trying to be evasive. It's just, I don't remember. It wasn't anything special. I didn't have GH or insulin. Uh, regarding GH and insulin, I've tried GH. I've never, I've never been, I'm too cheap to use it all the time because I don't want to use the generic stuff. I only want to use pharma and I've used it a couple times. I think I got a little fuller, but I only used, the longest I ever used it for was like two months. And it does take months and months, everybody says, to really see the results. Insulin, I used one winter. So that was the winter, I believe, of 2013 going into 2014. Hit an all-time high in my body weight of 245 at 5'8". But it was a sloppy, messy, nasty-looking 245. Um, but what's been consistent in the training? I trained hard. I took sets to failure. Um, always did a lot of basics. The only ones I... Full deadlifts I did up until I hurt my back, but I did a lot of rack deadlifts. I did a ton of tons of barbell rows, dumbbell rows. I used to love dips, weighted dips. I used to do those easy with two plates, three plates for a couple shitty reps. Chin ups, like close grip chin ups, especially I could do those with a two forty fives on. Um, I wasn't about strength at all, really, but you know I had my pride. I was a young guy, and I wanted to. Get, I did want to be stronger. Didn't want to be seen as like that guy that had. Uh, the big muscles but couldn't lift anything and you know I, I never got that big obviously you know i'm not i'm not the size of a pro i understand that uh the pros like at the olympia level i'm somewhere between your average gym rat and that I'm, I'm a lot bigger than the average guy in the gym i'm built a lot better but i'm not built like the guys on the olympia stage obviously so anyway now i'm going to get to some of your questions because you've been very patient with me uh it's my mother did you use gabergoline for lower no gabergoline i've never used it no, there's a lot of things I've never used. It's not that I have anything against them. I'm just kind of lazy. <laughs> so I've never used cabergoline ever. Uh, so can't answer that one. Days oh, you asked that twice in a row. Don't usually come across MD semen about out to run. Should seem his twenties. I don't know who you're talking about. Yeah, some of you guys don't speak to him. Don't speak to people about legitimate questions. I don't know who you're talking about. Nautilus is awesome. Yeah, I mean, they were, they made some great great equipment. They still do PPL routine. Yeah, I, I still train. SARMs, I've tried them. I wasn't that impressed. Uh, the way I train now is push-pull legs. The, the routine that I use most of that time, most of the time I've been training, is your typical bro split, like chest and triceps, back, take a day off, shoulders and biceps, legs, something like that. Usually, uh, for many years, I train four days a week. Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. But now, uh, I like training push-pull legs. It's a quicker, I, I don't do as much for each body part, obviously, but I train it more frequently. So everything gets hit every fourth day. I enjoy it a lot. Uh, you know, there, there's no magic routine. If you find one that you like and it works well for you, keep doing that, guys. Dope, good, what else we got here? Big fan from Egypt. Well, you got a great Mr. Olympia champion there now. Can you not use insulin in pro level? Of course you can. They all use insulin. Most of them. I shouldn't say all. Most of them do. Uh, what I use for pro lowering prolactin? Nothing. I guess I didn't. I didn't worry about it. I wasn't aware that was going to be a problem. I never got gyno, and I think that's that's luck because I've only used um, aromatase inhibitors. You know, for years I would do Clomid after cycle for PCT therapy. 
Uh, last couple shows I did, I used Aromasin in the last four or five weeks because I found my lower body would get a lot harder when I knocked, knocked out my estrogen. Like my glutes, I couldn't get my glutes to really come in without doing that. Um, but as far as prolactin, I never worried about it. I never took anything during my cycle. Uh, a lot of guys would take uh, Nolvidex. I would do Clomid and Nolvidex after cycles, but I never did them during. And I did plenty of tests. Uh, I've heard Greg Valentino, he had a theory that, because he had small nipples and he said he never used anti-estrogens and he never got gyno. He thinks the bigger your nipples are, the more susceptible you are to getting gyno. There might be something to that. And it sounds crazy, but it's so crazy it might be true. But yeah, I never worried about it, so I was lucky. Uh, what were the effects of Anadrol? Uh, I don't know about it. injectable Anadrol. Is that a, is that a thing? Uh, I didn't feel depression with oxymethylone. One thing, one thing Anadrol did for me after a couple weeks on it, and I think most people have this experience, is real nauseated. I couldn't, it knocked out my appetite. I didn't want to eat. I'd start eating and I'd feel like I couldn't eat much more, which is bad. If you're trying to make gains, you need to have an appetite. You need to eat. Uh, okay, you're 46 from India, doing a workout from three years. Can you use steroids for your muscle building? You're a grown ass man. You can do whatever you want. You know, they have, a, they have risks. I've been very, very fortunate, knock on wood, but I'm very lucky. I get heart scans. Uh, I did find a couple years ago when I started doing all the heart scans and the calcium scores that I did have some calcium in there. I'm on a, a low dose of statin. I'm on 10 milligrams a day of a, of a generic atorvastatin. Seems to be controlled. I see a cardiologist twice a year uh, in addition to going to my regular doctor because, you know, the heart is the main thing that takes the, the brunt of the damage from long-term steroid abuse. And the way we bodybuilders use it is abuse. It's not, it's not use. It's not TRT when you're doing, when you're banging 500 to a thousand grams of test and you're throwing on Decker or Equipoise Trend. That's not TRT. That, that's a cycle. Um, yeah. Uh, I take an AI, my muscle hardness goes away. That's weird. When I take AIs, when I took them for my shows, I, my muscles look harder because my, you know, my estrogen was down. And I was, uh, Retaining less water. Uh, I'm not going to give cycles advice here, guys, because I'm really not that qualified. How many hours a day do I train? About 90 minutes with weights and a half hour cardio, and I stretch. So it's about two hours of training, and I do that three days on, one day off. I'm 51 years old, guys. I know it's hard to, you know, if you see my smile, you see all the damn wrinkles, but they're there, trust me. Uh, what's worse for health, being fat with skewed lipids or being on gear and in decent shape? Uh, you know, it's different. Some people look very healthy on the outside and they're they're not healthy inside other people are you know you can minimize your risk if you're on gear i think you should be definitely be doing cardio to keep your hearts and heart and your hearts heart and lungs healthy you should be eating clean you should be eating a lot of fiber antioxidants drinking plenty of water you know taking a lot of health type vitamins and supplements things like that you know doing the best you can and monitoring your health with with blood work and you know if, especially if you're over 40 you should be seeing your cardiologist once a year at least to get the heart scans and all that MRI of the heart, make sure everything's fine. You're not getting like a super thick uh, left ventricle wall. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Yeah, if you guys have specific steroid questions, I do a show every week with Dr. George Tuliados called Ask Dr. Testosterone. It's on this channel. Just go to the most recent video and throw your questions in the comments here and we get to them. Uh, what was I got? Uh, 500,000 grams of test. LOL because that's a lot or that's not a lot? I don't know why you're LOLing. Do I recommend orals over injectables? Absolutely not. Quite the opposite, actually. I, I If you're going to use steroids, injectables, they bypass the, that first pass of the liver. So you're going to get less liver toxicity and damage. Um, it, it's crazy. You know, a lot of people have this thing about needles. They don't like needles. And I get that. Trust me, you'll get over it after you've done X amount of shots. But in the meantime, if you're just taking pills all the time, it's got to go through your entire you know, your digestive system. It's going to be got to go through your, your liver, your kidneys, whereas injectable is directly into your, into your, into the muscle where it's going to dissipate slowly into the bloodstream. So you're not having that type of damage. If you're going to do steroids and you had to pick either or all orals or all injectables from a health point of view, injectables are the way to go. Uh, what else we got is, is TR, uh, could AIs interfere with GH benefits? I have no idea. I'm sorry. Safest way to use insulin. 
No, I'm not qualified to answer that either. You know, it's funny when I when I used insulin and I got fat later on. I talked to Milos Sharshev, who's Sharshev. He's really the one who uh, brought insulin into the bodybuilding world. He was he was the pioneer of it, if you want to call it that. His parents are both doctors, and he like would read medical journals, and that's how he figured out insulin might be something could help bodybuilders. And he tried it on himself, got good results. He started using, it. but he told me. Um, because I ate cookies, that was my post-workout thing, cookies, which have not only a lot of sugar, but a lot of fat, that I was totally ruining the effects. That's why I, I sucked and I got fat instead of muscular. Your girlfriend is wet, awesome. Wet, wet ass P, great song of 2020, right? What a, what a year we've had, guys. Uh, is TRT okay to be used at 53? Absolutely, absolutely. I'm 51, I've been on TRT, and I'm not saying I don't use more than TRT at times, at a lot of times, but if you're over 50, and you feel, you know, your libido has gone down, your energy levels have gone down, uh, you're losing muscle mass even though you're still training, get your hormone levels checked, guys. Go get your free testosterone, your total testosterone, your SHBG, get all that checked because men's health is a legitimate field of medicine now. Uh, Dr. Thomas O'Connor, who I do occasional shows with, we used to do them every week, uh, Ask the Anabolic Doc, he does that. That's that's one of his main things. He treats men for hypo uh, hypogonadism, you know, you, low, low test levels can either be genetic or they can be brought about by steroid use. And that's, if you've used steroids for many years, your body's never going to produce it inadequate amounts again, except in some rare cases, some guys I've talked to, yeah, they, I'm still making plenty of tests. God love you. But if you need it, if you feel like your, your test is low, get it tested. And there are doctors, there are plenty of doctors, endocrinologists or your regular, your regular uh, primary care physician. If not, you know, look up men's health in your area. You'll, you'll come up with some places. Obviously there's tons of life extension clinics in places like Florida, Arizona, Palm Springs, California that, you know, especially now with telemedicine, you probably won't have to ever see a doctor. They'll just have you do some blood work at a local like quest diagnostics or whatever. But yeah, if you're 53, your chances are your test is, is much, much lower than it was in the peak years of your late teens through your twenties. It's probably down significantly by the time you're 50 get it, get it. You know, TRT is just to bring you to high normal levels. It's not, TRT is not to get you jacked like a bodybuilder. It's so you can feel more energy again, have a better sex drive again. Um, just feel better. You know, why not? Why would you want to feel worse? Uh, let's see. Thank you. Do some research. Say it. Uh, how many calories a day? Uh, when I diet, it was, I used to keep track. Obviously I haven't dieted. I haven't competed since 2013. But I used to average about 25, 2,000 to 2,500 a day, I think. I never went too much higher than that or too much lower. And um, how many grams of carbs do I eat a day? Mm, it averages probably about four or 500. I take in about three to 400 grams of protein. I'm 51. I don't eat as much as I used to, the volume. I, I try to stay leaner and lighter. I feel better that way. It's not healthy for a, a person over 50 to be huge and bulked up. It's just not. It's a lot of strain on the heart. You get high blood pressure. I'm a lot more concerned with health and longevity now than I was when I was younger, obviously, because, you know, I have friends, I have had friends and people I've known that are my age or younger that are dead now. Heart attacks, cancer. You, you just become, as you get older and you start losing a lot more people, like almost my whole family's gone. Parents, grandparents all gone. All my aunts, all my uncles, a uh, sister, cousin. You know, you lose so many people, you become a lot more aware of your own mortality, you realize I'm gonna die someday. What can I do to make sure that that's later rather than sooner? Anyway, uh, let's see what else we got here. How many calories? Sarshev Insulin Guru, Triple H. She thinks you are a sexy man. Sorry, are you talking to somebody else? Did Rami inject his legs to get them that massive? I don't think so. I don't think he did, no. I think I think Rami has awesome leg genetics and he trained them very hard. I've, I've gone on record several times saying I think Rami should downsize his legs a little. I think he'd have overall much better flow to his physique because his arms are awesome. Don't get me wrong, but they're not like his legs. His legs are just like, geez, they're so big. I think he could downsize them. I think he did downsize them a little bit for this Olympia. I think because his waist was tighter, I think his quads came down a little bit. His shape to me, his lines, this is the best Rami I'd ever seen for sure. Uh, what else? Brent Byers... Yeah, you're being a troll. Okay. All right, I'm going to refresh one more time to see if there's any more questions. If not, we're going to call it a day, guys. Oh, I went to... Where did the live stream go? Oh, there it is. Brent Byers, you're being a troll. I just want to make sure I got all your questions, guys. 
best carb to cut weight on? Uh, you know, we, we all respond differently to different foods. Like if I tell you eat rice and that doesn't agree with you or potatoes or something, that's not for you. Um, I always dieted on you know, white rice. I, I tried brown rice. It was just, I didn't like it. You have to chew it forever. It's like rubbery because it still has the, the, the husk or something on it, right? Um, carbs, my carbs when I dieted would be oats, oatmeal in the morning for my first meal. And the carbs for the other meals would be sweet potato, sometimes a red potato. I would usually bake them uh, and white rice. Yeah, I didn't have any other carbs. And, you know, vegetables. I used to have raw, raw broccoli. Ugh, God, gave me the worst gas. Uh, best carb to cut. Bulking can use trinase and test propionate. Of course you could. Yeah, you know, if you can't, if you can't bulk, if you can't gain weight on test and trend, man, you need to find something else to do because you're probably not going to make many gains. Uh, what else? Did I miss anything? I'm going to ch check THT. What's THT? I know. I should know that, right? What's THT? T. I don't know what that means. Sorry, guys. <laughs> if I can't understand the question, I'm not going to answer it. Uh, do I think Phil Heath will be back? I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't know if I, part of me wants him to come back better, like redeem himself. He looked pretty good, but, you know, the, the midsection was still was still an issue. And I don't know if he can fix that. If he can't, I don't want to see him come back again like that. But, you know, who am I? I don't know. I'm supposed to talk to Hani, Hani Rambod soon. I definitely want to ask him about that, what he thinks the issue was. Because uh, it was enough to knock him down to third. Uh, let's see. What else we got? How do I sh you shrink blocky waist? <sighs> If it's a bone structure issue, look at where your hip bones are, see? Okay, look at that big gut. Your hip bones, if your hips are this wide and that's the bone, you're not gonna make your, your bones shrink. If it's an issue of you have a blocky big gut or something, you can reduce that. That's a totally different situation, but a blocky waist, if it's genetically blocky, like, you know, genetics are so critical in bodybuilding. In all the divisions, you want to have wide clavicles and a narrow waist, and that's just your bone structure. You see it actually the most pronounced in the men's physique guys in the classic. They have these crazy V tapers, wide shoulders and upper backs, and little narrow waists. You know, that's that's their bone structure. Real small, small hips, small midsection. Because uh, we're all born with a certain genetic blueprint that we, we all do the best we can with what we've been given. Like I said. Some of you have wor way worse genetics than me. You're never going to look as good as me. Some of you have much better genetics, and you're going to look way better than I ever did. It's just, we're all different, guys. Uh, Chad said in an interview, best cardio for cutting fat, whatever you like. Anything that you like that you're getting uh, getting your heart rate up, getting your breathing up. Me, I always liked um, the elliptical runner. That's me. For some reason, I love going fast on that thing. I actually broke one at my old gym going so fast. Uh, never liked the treadmill. I'd step mill, I would do, once I had like, I was down to the last few weeks, say the last four or five weeks, and the, it was that real stubborn fat in the, in the hips and glutes. I'm sorry, in the glutes and the, in the hands, that area. Uh, I would hit the step mill, and that seemed to always get me past the plateau with fat, but really anything uh, that gets your heart rate up and gets you sweating that you can, that you can enjoy. Uh, I don't like the, the stationary bike, personally. Uh, how often do I check testosterone, testosterone levels? Me personally, twice a year. Best cardio. Hey, Ron, Chad said interview after Arnold Classic, he spotted what Big Romney's doing wrong. Was He was warming up backstage and losing muscle definition. If it was something that simple, wow. <laughs> that was an easy fix. You eat brown rice? No, I don't like brown rice. I eat white rice every year. Jasmine, jasmine rice, I should say. It's not quite the same as white, right? Tastes good, though. Uh, this Olympia, I saw Rami pumping up and confused. Uh, why don't I eat brown rice? I just don't like it. Uh, it. I know it's nutritionally, it's a little better and everything, but it's 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 hard to eat. It's like I got a rubbery texture because it still has the husk on the on the grain of rice, and it takes me long. I'm a slow eater anyway, so if you put in another, add in another factor, you know, I eat five solid meals in one shake a day, and I spend so much time a day eating. I can't. It's it's hard to get all my my work done. It's, I can't imagine eating, spending more time eating. Uh, let's see. Do I have kids myself? Uh, I have a daughter who's she's 26. She'll be 27. She's Marisa Groove Baby with a, two Y's at the end on Instagram. She's a DJ. Not into fitness. Uh, my son, Christian, he's 21. He goes to the gym. I've actually been 
taking him to the gym since he was like 12. He hated it for the first few years. He's starting to like it now. Um, doesn't have quite the drive. He's not crazy like I was. And I mean, crazy. I, I'm not trying to put down you know, mental illness. I'm just saying I was like obsessed. Like he likes to, he wants to be bigger and everything. He likes to be stronger. He likes, he wants to look better, but you know, he's really not willing to, to torture himself and suffer the way I did. I, to me, like once I got into it, no amount of pain was too much for me. I would do all drop sets, supersets, forced reps. You know, I would go to like my eyes were bugging out of the head, my head, veins are popping out of my, I was just, I was just, that, that's me. Um, blood work. Can you lose weight naturally eating carbs like rice? Yes. Uh, uh, Merry Christmas. Thank you. You too. Why not brown rice? Don't like it. Uh, when I train first thing in the morning, uh, I wouldn't, to clarify, I do train in the morning, but I always have a real good breakfast. I don't like, I've only trained on an empty stomach a few times in my life, and it sucked. I hated it. Had no energy, couldn't get a pump. You know, it's better for fat burning. It's better for releasing growth hormone, but your workout will suck. You're not going to make gains that way. Trust me. That, that's my opinion. Because uh, I have, so my breakfast every morning is a very, it's the same freaking breakfast every morning. It's four whole eggs, usually scrambled. Sometimes I'll let it sit there and then fold it over and put some cheese on it and make a little omelet. But it's four whole eggs. It's a bowl with uh, one cup of dry oats. And then I put, uh, I, right now I put the, uh, the greens product from, um, not Fade Out. That's the Redcon makes a product for greens. Oh, I can't remember what it is. It's, I put that and then I put a scoop of uh, collagen and then I put some blueberries and I have a cup of coffee with some extra protein powder in that. So my breakfast is pretty substantial. It's probably, it's probably about 70 grams of protein. It's a lot of protein. It's probably about uh, 200 grams of carbs, probably about 30 grams of healthy fats from the, uh, the whole eggs. It's a big breakfast. And then I typically start training right around 90 minutes after I finish eating. So I'll drive to the gym. And on the drive, I start drinking my pre-work. I drink my pre-workout shake, which is a mix of uh, Redcon, Big Noise, and Total War. I do a scoop of each. What else we got? Jess Rodriguez, yeah, he can be top six for sure. What happened to Juan Morel? He posted. I think he took last. Now Juan, uh, Juan and his wife had this successful cookie business called My Cookie Dealer. Oh, these are the most delicious cookies. They're so successful. The company grew so fast. They were one of the sponsors of the Olympia weekend this year. You know, they had like samples all over the place. The company is blown up. I think they have like 45 full-time employees. So it's been a lot of work, I'm sure, to, to grow that company so quickly. And Juan was saying, you know, he was, wasn't getting a lot of rest. He's got young kids. Um, I'm sure he was putting a ton of time into the company to make it even, you know, to handle everything. And he was training twice a day. It was just too much. You could tell his body looked tired. Didn't have that fullness and pop. Uh, you know, I don't know if he'll be back. Uh, you know, he's t he's still capable of very strong showing at the Olympia. But he, I think it's obvious to him he can't really do the business side with the cookie, my cookie dealer business, and prepare for something like the Mr. Olympia at the same time. Do I work each body part once or twice a week? So I do push-pull legs three days in a row and then one day off. So the push day is chest, shoulders, triceps. The pull day is back. Uh, traps, I don't always work traps, rear delts and biceps, and then legs is legs. And then I take a day off and I do it all over again. So every body part of mine gets hit every fourth day. Some weeks you don't see an improvement. Oh yeah, no, you know, you're not gonna see, progress is never linear. It's never perfectly linear. When you first start training, the gains are pretty steady because it's very new to your body. Your body has never had this kind of stimulus before. So it has to adapt and it does that by, uh, you know, growing bigger and stronger, the muscle fibers, they multiply, they get thicker, this and that. But uh, I need a drink, guys, sorry. The longer you train, the harder it is to make any further gains. It's going to be harder and harder because you're going to be getting closer and closer to your full potential. So like I probably maxed out naturally by the time I was 26, 27. Then I went on gear and that broke me past that plateau. Uh, I suspect, and from talking to a lot of people, if I had ever, if I had ever invested more in growth hormone, that might have taken me a little bit more. I might have been able to get a little bigger than I ever got. But you know, at this point, it's it's not. You know, what, I'm 51. I have a, I have a good job here. What am I? What do I need to be that much bigger for? What would it really do for me? Uh, best supplementation for joint health. There's so many guys. I, I don't. I don't want to say there's any one that's that's like awesome or way better than the other ones. 
a good joint formula. I honestly don't know, to be honest, to be honest with you, I don't know how much those joint joint products help. Once you once the damage is done, like I have advanced, I have osteoarthritis in both my shoulders. I don't think there's a supplement in the world that's gonna, you know, I need a shoulder replacement on this one. There's no supplement in the world that's gonna grow back. You know, I I wore out the uh, the cartilage in between the bones. It's that was completely gone years ago. It's been bone on bone for probably like 15 years at this point. You know, I had my first surgery. I've only had one surgery there. I had surgery there in um, fall of 2011. It was called a decompression, and they just went in arthroscopically, and, and they scraped out more room in the acromion, so there was a little more room for the, the ball of the humerus up here to move around, but I still need a new shoulder. Uh, can you still make gains after age 40? Be honest, brother. It all depends. When did you start, um, and have you used gear? If you started training it when you are like 15, it's pretty safe to say uh, by the time you're 40, you've made all the gains you're going to make. Now, have you used drugs? If you haven't used drugs and you're 40 and you go on drugs for the first time, you're going to make new gains all over again. It's going to start over, and then those gains are going to slow down and stop. You know, otherwise, we don't make, we don't have 1,000-pound bodybuilders walking around. There's, you know, there seems to be an upper limit. Even the biggest guys, the very biggest guys are in the 300 to you know, 300, Rami was like 350 in the off season, I think at one point, but typically 300 to 320 is the very upper range for how big a bodybuilder can get even in the off season uh, and dieted down, you know, anyway, but yeah, you can make gains. It, it's, it's, it's not so much your age, it's your training age. So if you're 40 years old and you are just starting to train now, you're going to make great gains. Will you make the same gains as if you'd started training when you're 18 or 20? Probably not, because you probably don't have the same hormonal environment. You probably don't have as much testosterone and growth hormone in your system as you used to. But you're still gonna you're still gonna make great gains. And then, you know, like I said, you'll you'll, you'll get naturally, and then that's eventually gonna come down to a crawl. Then, if you want to introduce anabolics, growth hormone, whatever, SARMs, I don't know. You, you'll you'll get past that. Uh, what's the size of Rami waist? I don't know. It's smaller than it used to be. That's all. I'm, uh, I think of arachidonic acid as something. I am, you know what? I'm going to try it. I've never tried it. I did that interview uh, on this channel with Dr. He's not a doctor. I'm sorry. Bill Llewellyn, who writes the anabolics books, which are pretty much the ultimate authority on, on steroids with drug profiles and pictures of how to spot counterfeits. The, the la it's in the 11th edition now. It's like 832 pages called anabolics, just 11th edition. Um, so he makes a product. He also has a company called Molecular Nutrition. And he has an arachidonic acids product called X Factor. I'm very interested in trying it. And I texted him, he's supposed to send me some. And if it works, because uh, he says people who have hit a plateau, you know, from steroids, from this and that, and they, they're not making any more progress, it's worked for them to make new gains. So, you know, if I can get a little bigger, yeah. Obviously, I'm not going to be Rami or anything, but if I could be a little bit bigger, why not? I'll try it. So I'll let you guys know, uh, probably on my Instagram, Ron Harris Muscle. I, you know, I'm not going to hawk supplements on on the md channel i'll do that on my own social media steel supplements overhyped i don't know 33 inch waist yeah probably still free weight squatting in the training no i don't do much of that if i do i don't go heavier than 225 i used to do 315 to 405 for many sets many reps all the time um typically work my, my typical have the heaviest sets for many years uh, you know, I would do like 315 for 20, 365 for 12 or 15, 405 for 10. If I was feeling super strong that day, I would do like, uh, put a quarter on. So that's 455. So I used to do a lot of squatting, but now it's really my lower back. I do have some knee pain and my quads, I've had some minor quad tears over the past 10 years or so. It doesn't seem like my, my ligaments and all that, and especially my lower back, can handle heavy barbell squats. So I do a lot of leg presses, Smith machine squats, hack squats. Lately, it's been almost all leg presses. And God willing, I'm able to keep my, my, my leg mass at 51. I don't know why. You know, my upper body, like I said, it's, it's, my shoulders are definitely not what they used to be, and that's probably because the joint issue. I can't, I can't do any free weight presses overhead. I can only use machines, and even then, not that heavy. Not like the old days. Uh, but no, I don't do a lot of free weight squats anymore. But I did for many, many years. I built my legs with free weight squats. So, you know, don't always ask an older bodybuilder what they're doing now because that's not how they built the, their muscle mass. That's that's not what got them to where they, the physique you're looking at now. Now a lot of them are just maintaining or they're injured. 
you know, struggling against aches and pains and injuries like me, and we, we train around them with most of the machines. Can Phil fix his gut and win Mr. Ogan? I don't know. What's a good age to start your child in bodybuilding? Do they have to avoid certain exercises? I would have, you know, any a kid of any age can do like calisthenics, uh, pull-ups, chin-ups, sit-ups, jumping jacks, you know, the like stuff they do in uh, military or, or law enforcement, boot camps, basic training, academy type of stuff. I wouldn't personally start my kid on weight training until they were starting puberty. And my son was 12 and he's half Cuban, so he was starting, he was into puberty. He already had like a little, looked like a little smear of dirt on his upper lip. <laughs> Do I bear knee when squat? Uh, I've, I've had knee wraps. I don't like them. I had more knee pain when I was using knee wraps than ever. And I, I was probably putting them on too tight and compressing the patella up against the, uh, whatever the bone behind it is. But I don't like knee wraps, um, personally. I, I know some people swear by them. Uh, I did find that you could go heavier, but, you know, that's like... Dorian Yates used to... Someone someone asked Dorian, why don't you use knee wraps? You'd be able to squat heavier. And he said, I could put a big spring up my ass and squat heavier too, but I'm not going to do that. So, you know, I don't think you necessarily have to train so heavy. If you can't get a good... With squats, I feel if you can't get like a good 8 to 10 reps, deep reps on your own without struggling... No, I shouldn't say without struggling. But if you can't do that, you don't need to start wrapping your legs to do more and more weight. What's the point? You're not a power lifter. Or maybe you are. I don't know. Uh, what else we got? Benz. Are they bad? Are benzos bad for muscle building? I suspect they are, but I'm not really sure. Uh, of course you can win. Dude, do I have knee when squatting? Best exercise for increasing arm size. If you find out, tell me. Uh <laughs> Yeah, that's been the bane of my existence. My arms never responded uh, the way everything else did. Unfortunately, I have great genetics for pecs. See the size of these fuckers? And I don't know why. And my quads, uh, my shoulders were pretty pretty big. They responded well. My arms, not so much the biceps. My biceps are okay. They're not they're not terrible at all. I'd say they're mediocre. Uh, and when they when I'm really lean, they look good because they have splits and veins and details in them. Um, Especially, in, I have a lot of detail in these weird areas, but um, triceps never responded that well for me. But, you know, I would agree the best exercises are probably the basics. Dumbbell curls, barbell curls, preacher curls, uh, machine curls, skull crushers, weighted dips, close grip bench presses, you know. Don't ever think there's like a best exercise. If you find an exercise that you really feel a good connection with the muscle and the muscle gets pumped and tight, sore the next day. Don't, don't worry that nobody else says this is a great mass builder. You keep doing that exercise because we're all different. We all have different structures and leverages. You might find some exercises that are so good for you, not so good for other people. And other people might have exercises like, like the barbell bench press. Like I said, not only wasn't I good at it, I wasn't very strong at it, but I didn't get the best connection. I always felt a better contraction, got a better pump using dumbbells and hammer strength machines. So that's how I built my chest. I didn't do... I didn't do much barbell be flat bench. By the time I was like uh, 20, I think I was done barbell bench pressing. I, I, I said, I hate, I hate this. I'm giving up on it. And I just went dumbbells. But uh, what else? Increasing arm size. You're a hard gainer? There's not many people that are actual hard gainers. Let me say that right now. A lot of you people who think you're hard gainers, I used to have that mentality too. I thought I was a hard gainer. There are not many people that gain, gain muscle mass super easy. The easy gainers, there's not many of them. There's not many people that have a really hard time putting on muscle either. Most of us are in the middle. Most of us have an average ability to put on muscle mass. No better or worse than the other guys. So keep tra if you keep training, you're consistent with your training, you're eating, and you're resting, you'll make gains over time. You're not going to look like the guys on the Olympia, the Arnold stage, because they're genetic freaks. But you're going to look a whole lot better than you did before. I'm just going to do a couple. You can do overhead press on machine with palm facing in. Yeah, I do. That's what I do. I I didn't bother getting deep into that because this isn't a training video, but this grip is much better for me than this grip. When I turn my hands this way, it's I don't feel the strain on my shoulders. Uh, electricity shock training. I don't know enough about it to comment on it. This is true to Flex Lewis. Don't know anything about that. Do I feel well, I was blessed with genetics for bodybuilding? Like I said, better than average, better than the average guy, but not, not spectacular genetics by any means. If I had spectacular genetics, I'd look like those guys because I've done everything they've done you know, maybe a little growth hormone that they've done that I haven't, but I've done tons of, tons of steroids over the years. Trained my ass off, ate tons of good food. I don't look like those guys. Why? Genetics. Those people, they respond differently. They're, they're an elite. 
They're in the minority. They're special. They're genetic freaks. Their bodies respond differently to the training, to the food, to the drugs. They have a different look to them. Sometimes I joke that they're like another species, but they are very different from the average person. New Bedford, great whaling. How many meals a day do I have? Any target for water intake? I probably do like two two gallons of water a day, but I don't I don't count it. I just drink with my meals and between meals, get plenty of water. Five solid meals and one shake is what I do. Uh, since you're in here, if you're blessed. Should Brian go to 212? That's up to him. I'd like to see him fill out and see how good he could be as a 212 now, just like George Peterson. I think Breon, a fuller, bigger Breon, would be a hell of a 212 bodybuilder. I think he'd do very, very well immediately as a 212. Post-workout routine, eating or drinking-wise. Okay, so when I finish training, I go stretch for a few minutes, and then I have two Rice crispy Treats, the little bars from Costco. It's only about 40, 50 grams of sugar. And I either have, if I'm going to be eating very soon, like if I have, if I'm going to be eating very soon, I just do the essential amino acids. I do grunt from uh, Redcon. If I'm going to be not eating for a little longer, uh, the shake will be uh, whey protein isolate. Sometimes I'll even mix that with like a, a blend. So it's whey protein and like a, a casein together. But uh, it's a shake. And then usually about 90 minutes later, if it's, if I'm just having to eat the essential aminos, I'm hung, I can eat sooner because it goes through me quicker. But after that, it's the same meal every time. It's chicken breasts from the chicken pound. Yeah, buddy. Chicken breast and white rice. I do like, uh, I do about uh, eight ounces of chicken and probably about a cup and a half. Depends. I eat more carbs after a back workout or a leg workout. So it's probably like a, uh, it's probably like a cup and a half normally, then two cups on the on the leg or back days. Uh be on post workout. What do I think of post workout cereal? Yeah, I was eating cereal too. When before the Rice Krispie, I was doing like uh, like fruity pebbles or cocoa pebbles or Lucky Charms. I think you just want sugar. You want a lot of sugar. Simple sugars. Cereal is good too. So I've been doing Rice Krispie treats because they're they're pre packaged. They're just so easy. The the cereal I had to sit there with a spoon and. It took a lot of longer to eat. I'm trying to get out of the gym and get home, back to work. Uh, what do I do? Think post work. Uh, Kai Green comes back. Can he please top five? Probably. All right, guys. I'm gonna wrap it up. Jeez, I've been yapping for well over an hour. It's ridiculous. So I appreciate you guys watching. I hope this was helpful. I hope you learned something. If you have questions, further questions, leave them in the comments. I will get to them and answer them. Uh, the ones that I can't answer. If I can't, I'll let you know. So I appreciate you guys watching. Have a happy holiday. Stay safe. Looking forward to a better 2021. Uh, hopefully we can put all this COVID nonsense behind us and get back to real life. Appreciate you guys. You know, without without you guys watching these videos, I'd be I'd be in big trouble. So that's it. Thanks for watching. Talk to y'all later.